And again, the Lord God hath commanded that men should not murder, that they should not lie, that they should not steal, that they should not take the Lord of their God in vain. We sort of skipped on fucking 14-year-olds, though, that they should not envy, that they should not have malice, that they should not have contented one with another, that they should not commit whoredoms, and that they should do none of these things, for whoso doeth them shall perish, except for all that one which, guy. All of which they all did, right? Like right. Joseph, Joseph, had, Joseph hit all of these. <laughs> Literally, like. Like I Bring we could, I could spend an entire two hour block of this show just going one yeah. by one and providing citations yeah. of every single time Joseph Smith did one of those things. Yeah. Into this list here, they should not have malice. Now you just told me earlier in earlier episodes of this, you 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 mentioned that uh, that he had a militia, <laughs> up, and 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 he's he's ready to take over the country with his militia, and that also that he had already commanded certain people to be quietly killed. Yeah, I, I guess we're having trouble with the definition of malice. What is it? What did that word mean in his time? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I look. The way that I interpret malice is that, you know, Joseph has genuine ill will towards somebody else. And there are a few examples of this, and most of it comes back to the Missouri Mormon War. Joseph Smith created a lot of fucking enemies when he went to war with an entire state. And what's interesting, too, is, you know, the Governor Lilburn Boggs signed the Mormon extermination order that, you know, basically said, if you're Mormon, get the fuck out of our state. And the Mormons almost, by and large, did uh, and spent the winter of 1838 to 39 crossing the Mississippi and going and resettling in Quincy, Illinois, uh, which were, and then they would eventually move to commerce that would be turned into Nauvoo. Joseph Smith was he escaped liberty jail uh, as a result of all of this he surrendered the mormons were outdone militarily they were surrounded and joseph smith surrendered well you're gonna have to give me a background story on this how how did you get let us know how he ended up in jail in the first place why are the why is he at war against a state right okay um so I, I'll recommend uh, Stephen Lesur's book, The 1838 Mormon War in Missouri, because it does a very good job of painting a picture of the culture at the time. But the Missouri Mormons had always had a very tense relationship with the non-Mormons living in Missouri. And there are a lot of factors that go into this, but economic factors were, were the primary influences in this. Essentially, the American government had relocated so many Native Americans and they had so much fucking land that the federal government basically said, if you homestead an area, you get that land. And the Mormons said, well, let's sign up for that program. So basically the, the idea is that you put down uh, a building and fencing and you basically civilize an area that's previously uninhabited, then you just get that. You don't actually have to buy that from the government. So the Mormons took advantage of this program. And how this worked was the, the government said that you had basically two years to uh, uh, turn a profit, to begin producing with the land that you uh, begin homesteading in order to take advantage of this government grant. The Missourians did not like the Mormons. There were a lot of cultural issues between them. There were a lot of um, a lot of Mormons moving into Missouri. And Joseph Smith declaring that Missouri is the Mormons' promised land. Well, I, you know, most of these people in America believe in, in Christianity and Jesus. And they know the old Bible that when a land is declared God's chosen people's land then it's really not good for the people who are currently living on that land. Well, I mean, so, you're just, you're just talking about what the Canaanites said about it. <laughs> <laughs> I would talk about what they said about it. If we had any of their records, <laughs> uh, same with yeah, the here's, Amalekites. Here's an interesting the thing. So, so Joseph Smith says that Missouri is their promised land. So this is, right. that means that God promised to give the Mormons Missouri. Correct. And Missouri said no. Yes. And God lost that argument? Uh, yes, very much so. 
Uh, and we just forget <laughs> that God lost that argument. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this th these tensions have been going since 1831. Uh, the Mormons began their settling, and when the two-year sunset portion of uh, came into uh, conflict or came into uh, uh, became relevant for the Mormons, they had to begin producing and selling within the two years in order to take advantage of the government program. The Missourians were like, "Hey, if those Mormons get to sell their crops, then they just get that land. So let's go burn their fucking crops. Make sure that they they don't get this land for free." Uh, so they did that, uh, and the Missourians uh, chased the Mormons off of their land. And it was look, it, it was a very ugly time uh, for Mormons living in Missouri. And there, there are a lot of other conflicts that come into this. You know, Missouri is a very controversial state, being a slave state that is north of the Mason-Dixon line. And the Mormons were largely northerners or European converts who are anti-slave, uh, pro-abolitionists. And that's the, the Mormons moving into Missouri by the thousands by the time we get to 1836-37 they the missourians now are beginning to lose power political power to the mormons who are now moving into their state and voting as a block for their own self-interest when missourians and when slaveholders uh you know political power is threatened they're going to take steps to ensure that the threat is neutralized and uh, the way that they did that was they removed mormons from their land um, Governor Lilburn Boggs uh, resolved this by basically creating a county for the Mormons. And I believe this was this was either Davies or Caldwell County. I can't remember which of the two counties. And he basically said, all right, you two are fighting so much. I'm going to draw a line across the floor and neither of you crosses it. And can we have peace this way? And uh, the Missourians and the Mormons were like, yes, we can live peacefully this way. And they did for about three years. And then Joseph Smith got excommunicated from his Ohio church and he went to Missouri and he excommunicated. Wait, how did Joseph Smith get excommunicated from his own church? A Kirtland Doesn't Safety he own Society. The, church? the Kirtland Safety Society. So it was uh, the, the Kirtland church uh, boiled over and he could no longer keep it under his control. The Kirtland Safety Society losing uh, huge amounts of Mormon uh, you know, retirement funds and everything. That was a huge problem. Joseph Smith was caught with Fanny Alger in the barn. Uh, Joseph Smith uh, that was the had 16 a 16-year-old. That's correct. Yep. Yep. Uh, one of the teenagers. Uh, Joseph Smith had a ton of problem, uh, problematic business practices. Uh, the lawsuit with Grandis and Newell, where apostles went up and testified that Joseph Smith commanded them to murder Grandis and Newell, uh, came to light. And then Martin Harris, the guy who funded the Book of Mormon, stood up and said in a fit of rage that he never saw the plates, but he just saw them with his spiritual eyes. Um, Which that means caused he imagined it. He imagined it. That's right. He closed his eyes really hard and wished he could see the plates, and he did. Uh, <laughs> so that, these are some of many, many factors that caused a hostile takeover of the Ohio church. And when I say hostile takeover, there was a legitimate hostile takeover at one point where the people who were led by Warren Parrish, who was an apostle at the time, came in with pistols and bowie knives, and there was a drunken brawl in the Kirtland Temple. Um, there, there's, there, there was a lot of events that led to Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon and Emma Smith and Brigham Young later fleeing in the middle of the night to get away from Kirtland church. Um, it was so hostile to them and Brigham Young had, uh, rescued Joseph Smith from an attempted assassination plot by his apostles. The, the Ohio church did not like Joseph Smith's leadership, so they removed him from the church. And Joseph Smith went to the Missouri church and he held a coup there of the Missouri leadership. These are operating as basically two independent branches with Joseph Smith giving revelation that was authoritative for both. But Oliver Cowdery and the Whitmers were running the Missouri church. So Joseph gets out there in early 1838 with Sidney Rigdon, who was a warmonger. And the and Joseph Smith excommunicates Cowdery and the Whitmers, and he signs what we read. And I think the first one was the Danite Manifesto that says, "Depart or depart, or a more fatal calamity shall befall you." Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you you, so, you caught me up there, I think. Yeah. So that's some of the background <laughs> that we didn't already discuss. 
For sure, for sure. And that's one of the struggles of dealing with this topically instead of chronologically is, is you know, some of the stories get a little disjointed. Um, so in any case, when Joseph gets out to Missouri, he becomes the problem. And that's when the Mormons begin to go to war against the state of Missouri. And uh, Joseph Smith, uh, through the year of 1838, like I said, Stephen Lesur's book is an excellent resource on this. Um, but throughout the year of 1838, he committed war uh, against the state of Missouri, and they responded by committing open war against the Mormons. And this all culminated in the Hansville Massacre, uh, the Battle of Crooked River and the Hansville Massacre, the Mormon Extermination Order, and the twin settlements of Far West and Adamondiamond, the two Mormon settlements in Caldwell and Davies counties. Uh, being surrounded by the Missouri State Militia, uh, as well as militia forces that had been borrowed from other nearby states. And the Mormons had to surrender or the uh, Missourians would siege their cities uh, and murder a whole bunch of Mormons. Okay, give me just a moment. I'm going to let him out the back door. I would like yeah, yeah, to... No worries. The, 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 the military, paramilitary conflicts you were just talking about, could you give a summary for those three things? Just happily. Just yep. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Okay. So, yeah. And so without getting too lost into the weeds of, uh, of the Missouri Mormon war, because it's, I mean, like I did 10 episodes on it and they were not very thorough episodes. It's, it's a huge and dense topic, right? Warfare always is. But, um, uh, Joseph Smith had his army of Israel and, uh, that were his known militia and he had his Danites, which were his shadow militia. And with his Danites, he had conducted raids on non-Mormon settlements to steal provisions because uh, the Missourians refused to trade with the Mormons. Uh, they had raided a military supply train, stolen stands of arms and a cannon. And it was uh, the Missourians responded in kind. The Missourians uh, raided uh, non-Mormon raided Mormon settlements to try and retake possessions that had been stolen from them. Uh, and in each of these cases, it's interesting. Joseph Smith was using religious language to uh, give license to what these Danites were doing. They were consecrating the Gentiles' property to the church, which was one of his commandments when he initially set up the Mormon communalistic system. Um, so. All of this is uh, culminates in a, a standoff between the Missourians and the Mormons. The Missourians surrounded the Mormon settlements and um, uh, a, a few um, uh, factors which led up to it was the Battle of Crooked River. The Mormons attacked a Missouri militia and dispersed it um, in aggression. And the the governor responded to that open act of hostility by signing the Mormon extermination order. And then the Hans Mill massacre happened where 18 Mormons were slaughtered in a blacksmithing shop. Um, and so this is this this is open warfare. The Mormons build up uh, breastwork around their cities. They dig trenches and they get ready for open warfare. But Joseph Smith realizes that if he is a prophet of a whole bunch of dead people, then he's not really much of a prophet. But if he's a prophet who surrenders and goes to jail, then he's a persecuted prophet of a whole bunch of living people. So he surrenders. Uh, he and Sidney Rigdon and Alexander McRae and Hiram Smith and a few and two others, uh, they surrender as the leaders of the Mormon movement. And then some 60 other uh, Mormon men are arrested as, as other leaders of this. They all end up escaping as well. Um, so the charges for Joseph Smith are arson, robbery, larceny, organized crime, and murder. Uh, and they tacked on later uh, uh, during the hearing the charges of high treason. Um, because he, he created a, 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 an insurrection militia. That's on the, the murder yeah. charge. Was that conspiracy to commit? Or, it was, was well, they, they charged him directly with it. Uh, I don't know if they, I can't remember if they actually tried to do a, a conspiracy because as you know, we discussed in the first one, Joseph Smith was a mob boss and he didn't get blood on his hands. That's what um, I was but ask I you think, about. I mean, it, it, is he suspected of ever having killed anybody directly? Yeah, and I don't think that he was directly charged with that murder, that they were using it as a blanket murder charge because Missourians had been murdered by the Mormons. Joseph Smith was the figurehead of the Mormons. I think it was conspiracy. His church, not necessarily him as a person. 
Uh, well, no, they were charging him and his fellow leadership. They were not charging the corporate entity of the church or anything like that. They were charging him and his fellow leaders with these charges. Um, so what ends up happening is a protracted five month long legal battle between Joseph Smith's lawyers and the Missouri prosecutors and, uh, Joseph Smith's lawyers negotiate a change of venue because they claim that they can't get an impartial jury in the state of Missouri, that's fair because <laughs> yeah. most of the Missourians hated the Mormons. <laughs> uh, so he, they negotiate a change of venue. And during this change of venue, Joseph Smith bribes uh, the guards with a couple barrels of whiskey and 50 bucks. And they're allowed to escape. <sighs> Once again, another butterfly effect thing where if Joseph Smith would have stood trial, he would have been hanged in Missouri in 1839. But instead he escapes and he goes on to Nauvoo and builds a stronger militia and a larger following and a bigger temple and runs for president of the United States. And my family would have been, I don't know, Baptists. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I would not be who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and in an important way, I wouldn't be either because one of the things that was influential uh, in, to me as a child uh, was when I lived in the Four Corners area, when we lived in Utah and, and Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, there were places there that, that were just, the Mormons are everywhere. They, everybody's Mormon. It's the status yeah. quo. That's right? Morador, so the Mormon when Morador. we moved from there to Los Angeles, suddenly there's no Mormons around. And it would, when people want to want to know what your religion I was, I, I always knew that that was going to be problematic because one, I, I didn't think it mattered what religion anybody was. You know, mm -hmm. Why should I care? Why why would you care? Uh, I, I didn't particularly attach myself strongly to any religious denomination for reasons I explained before. But then also, I knew that when I said my family is Mormon, and even though there's an ob obvious comma there, you know, that there's, there's probably going to be followed by a word, but. But. You know, but I never get there. I, I got to experience interdenominational Christian bigotry about how, you know, how much everybody hated the Mormons. Oh, yeah. And I, I realized early on that if you want to know what Mormons believe, don't ask a Baptist. <laughs> if you want to know what Hindus believe or Jews or Muslims or anybody, don't ask a Baptist. <laughs> Especially not when they're convinced that they know. Uh. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, I, I, that's, that was one of the things that, that really enhanced my skepticism was seeing how Christians treat each other. You know, because, I mean, technically, Jehovah's Witnesses are, are Christians too, right? Right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't know a whole lot about the Jehovah Wit Jehovah's Witnesses. They weren't one of the, you know, the, the kind of cults that I focused on. But I got the impression they think they're Christian. And what else yeah. do you need to be Christian other than you think you are? So yeah. I'm not defining other people. But I got to see how I was defined. I got to see how my you know, how people would stand outside my house. And, and when they find out that that I'm Mormon, right? Because that's how they mm -hmm. interpret that. Well, they, they would start telling me all these crazy things that Mormons believe. If you think I'm Mormon, why would you be telling me crazy things you think Mormons believe. Wouldn't I know better? Right? Wouldn't I, shouldn't I be able to tell you what I believe? Why are you telling me what I believe? Right. But I don't, but since I'm not Mormon myself, I don't have that option. I'm like, well, that's really interesting. You say all these crazy things. You want to come inside and tell my mom that she believes all these things? <laughs> it's, it's not the, it's a, yeah. Yeah. No, I still, of course, today, every day I have some idiot, uh, <laughs> amateur theologian telling me what I believe always <laughs> you believe everything came from nothing I don't uh, <laughs> you believe in no godism I don't you know uh, not not believing that there's a supernatural aspect of the universe it does not make me a believer in not not magicism right right which is, which is what they usually call materialism I don't know why unbelievers have to be cast as believers, but I'm constantly accused of everything I believe. And if anybody who was an atheist 
ever said anything I disagree with. Well, because they were an atheist, that means I have to defend what, and I have to believe right. what they said. So it was that sort of, uh, it, it was moving into that new environment, moving into Los Angeles. And now, see, now I'm in a mixing pot of every kind of religious perspective. There's a lot of Asian people that were, yeah. that were you know, it's LA, right? So, I mean, we, we have a whole lot of in, in, international people going on. This was way different than in the Four Corners area, mm -hmm. right? You, you had, you had Native Americans, you had Mexicans, you had white people, and the white people were all fucking Mormons. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what you had in Four Corners. And then you go to LA, and now it's a whole melting pot. And now you've got yeah. to broaden your mind. You have to think a little bit better and more broadly than you did. Right. And uh, so that was an advantage. If I was, if my family was, you know, the, the dominant religious perspective, would I have been the skeptic that I am as a result? I don't think so. Yeah, it, that is kind of one of those, uh, you know, we, we've talked about the butterfly effect so many times, uh, like what small cultural factors would influence me to be a very different person today? And, you know, it's for those reasons that I like I I say I'm an atheist because that's just one stance on one question. Is there any evidence to believe that God exists? No. OK, I'm an atheist. OK, so we can move on from that where I find a lot of liberty to play and experiment with beliefs is by saying I'm a cultural Mormon. The same way who somebody who is, you know, grows up Jewish but doesn't believe is a cultural Jew or a secular Jew. I'm a secular Mormon. I'm a cultural Mormon. Yeah, that, right? doesn't, this make is, lot, that, that doesn't make sense to every religion, but it does for the Jews and it does for the Mormons. Like I see that. Right. Right. And it's because these are my people. This is my language. This, you know, I this is pioneer blood in these veins, right? Like I, I descend from Mormon polygamy uh utah polygamy right like i this is my heritage this is my tradition this is my everything this is what i was born and bred in and if i didn't have the locus of control shifted to me that i am actively participating in this culture and instead this is something that is imposed on me from an outside force like just being born in utah or in the morador right then then it becomes no longer a subject of my desire. It becomes a subject of an outside person labeling me. Oh, you grew up in Utah. You were a Mormon, right? I say, uh, yeah, no, I am a cultural Mormon because I am embracing that identity. I'm Jew-ish. Ish. <laughs> Mormon-ish. <laughs> yeah, and then, right. and then, uh, coincidentally, uh, we, we moved around a lot. So I would, I would frequently find myself coming back with, with my, with my family, with my mom, especially from Los Angeles back to the four corners area and other Southern places, wherein I was, I was treated differently, culturally different again, because I, I completely attached myself to the, to the LA culture in the seventies, man. I was there. So right. there, uh, and so much more so than I could ever be in, you know, podunk little town or whatever, but that that guy, that was that was at the, the height of the satanic panic now, and so now I'm coming. I'm I'm into the L.A. heavy metal scene, right? R late seventies or so, the hard rock scene, all that, and now everybody's calling me satanic. Not so much just for what I look like, and not for much so for what the music that I listen to and all that, but if you speak irreverently of religion if you if you if you talk like a skeptic if you don't just like automatically buy whatever they sell you well then you're of the devil and right. again you talk about these little strange effects that you have on people would i have joined the satanic temple a year or two ago like i did for political reasons you know because i want to support their their activism and defense of the first amendment <laughs> had i not been accused of being satanic since i was a teenager right <laughs> right. <laughs> I was accused of being satanic at 14 because I listened to ACDC or because I had a t-shirt that said ACDC. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, absolutely. my son was attacked uh on on our street because he was wearing a t-shirt that said Harry that was a Harry Potter t-shirt. 
Fascinating. So when I come out, I see a grown man, an adult, pressing a Bible against my son's head three times. And when I see that, I come, and that guy sees me coming, and he flies into his house. Right. But he's not going to conference. He's not going to have a confrontation with me. And so, of course, my you know, I asked my son, "What was that about?" And he said, "Well, he he pressed this the Bible against my head three times and said, I rebuke thee, I rebuke thee, I rebuke thee.'" <laughs> Grown ass fucking adult with a nine or ten year old child. Doing casting that casting kind of a shit. magic spell over a Harry child. Potter t shirt. God damn. So, ignorance and bigotry that is Christianity to me. That's that's no. all I ever see of it. In many instances, it requires bigotry and and just out and out stupidity. <laughs> God damn. God damn. Okay, so I didn't mean to de- de- derail again. I, I, I have a tendency to throw my, my own little piece <laughs> where it's not necessary. Well, no, no, no. This is I, I can bring this thing back around, right? So what you are describing here is the vilification of a movement or of a people or of an idea or something and how effective that can be in propaganda, right? So the Mormons suffered the Missouri Mormon war and their expulsion from Missouri. And they sought refuge in the state of Illinois. They suffered what was labeled as persecution uh, in any other context would be, They were the losers of the war, so they dealt with what happens when somebody loses a war. But because Joseph Smith is a religious leader, these are a religious people, this is religious persecution, of course. So Joseph Smith now uses his, you know, battle cry is Missourians, Missourians, Missourians. They are persecuting us for our religion. You know, he boils it down to it's just religious persecution when there are all these litany of other factors that play into the Mormon war in Missouri that happened. Right. But he boils it down because a Christians want to be persecuted, even when that persecution is is impossible to exist. A company putting out red cups that don't say Merry Christmas on them is persecution. That's how bad they want to be persecuted. (laughs) Uh, So much persecution. But the, the the point is that when you are persecuted, you then have a person, you have a label, you have a movement or something that is your enemy. And the satanic panic was the satanic enemy of the great Christian nation of America in the 80s. Uh, Harry Potter was, you know, in the, the late, uh, you know, the late aughts, whenever, you know, it started coming out. Right. So like all of these things, they require an enemy. And Joseph Smith's enemy was the Missourians. And from the Mormon, Missouri Mormon War on, the Missourians always and were forever the enemy of the Mormons. And Joseph Smith would incorporate the Missourian experience and the problems in Missouri into many of his sermons throughout the Nauvoo era. And would oftentimes, when he was uh when he was suspecting one of his leaders of treachery of turning their back on him he would oftentimes speak in a public sermon that this person is working with the missourians so the missourians became the boogeyman of the mormons and as joseph smith rose in political power in nauvoo the missourians ended up becoming the public enemy of the mormons because At the end of the day, the Missourians had a legal claim to Joseph Smith. He escaped prison. That didn't make all of those charges of murder, arson, larceny, uh, treason. That didn't just make those charges go away. That made Joseph Smith a fugitive from the state of Missouri. But there was no interstate police force. So he's in Illinois. He's on the other side of a state line of Missouri. As long as he doesn't step foot in Missouri, there's nothing that he, that the Missouri can do to get him extradited so he can answer for those crimes. Uh, unless the governors of both of those states come to an agreement and sign an, a warrant of extradition that would allow a Missouri constable or sheriff or something to come into the state of Illinois arrest Joseph Smith and bring him back with that warrant of extradition. This nearly happened. Um, and it's a story it's that we can't how, really get how into. The, how the country worked before there was an FBI. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Right. 
Uh, yeah, this is 19th century America. There, you, If you committed the most heinous crimes, you could just cross a state line and you, you were fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating, isn't it? It is. <laughs> yeah. And having to get governors of states to agree on an extradition. I mean, like, <laughs> it's... Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, that's why there are some uh, some countries that are considered refuge countries. If you commit a crime in one country and they don't have an extradition agreement with another country, then you can flee to that other country and you're safe. Right. Um, so Joseph Smith utilized the lack of an interstate police force in order to to recommit all of the crimes, but to an, a greater extent while he was in Illinois. Uh, but it's interesting to note here that Missouri came to be the uh, the boogeyman of the Mormons. And he always, from the time that he escaped prison in Missouri uh, until his death, he treated Missouri with absolute malice. And a couple of examples of this is that he uh, all of his sermons where he cried against Missouri as he continued to gain military power he gave increasingly dangerous sermons about Missouri and stating in, you know, in vague terms that the Mormon war will go to Missouri. They will kill the anti-Mormons there. And uh, one of these, uh, he eventually became so enraged and just, just uh, apoplectic about Missouri that he published a... Uh, a circular that was called a friendly warning to Missouri. And you can find uh, my, my episode uh, naked Mormonism by the same title. Uh, but I read through the whole thing. And essentially what it was is Joseph Smith, while he was running for president, sent this friendly hint to the state of Missouri. And it's basically like, Hey, we are going to go to war with you as soon as I'm elected president. And uh, and Missouri was obviously not a big fan of this. Um, and they they factored into Joseph Smith being assassinated later on. But he even took a step further. And what he did is Joseph Smith called on the Green Mountain Boys and the Green Mountain Boys were a Vermont militia. Uh, they had uh, participated in the Revolutionary War and they had wide fame because of it. Uh, and Joseph Smith sent his petition to the Green Mountain Boys, these this this independent militia, asking for them to support him during his war against Missouri. So the, the overall takeaway is that had Joseph Smith been allowed to gain a tiny bit more military power, he would have began his overthrow of the American government by extinguishing the state of Missouri. The state of Missouri would be the beginning salvo of Joseph Smith's war against the United States. He would have gone on an absolute war path through that state. And uh, where it went after that, I don't know. But he always regarded Missouri as the most evil, the, the worst, when all that they did was respond to his actions. He was the aggressor in these cases. <laughs> 